Early in the morning, we see Mia, Alamia, which means part snake, part woman, and Kurusu cuddling. Kurusu tries to wake Maya up, but she asks for five more minutes to rest and let her body warm five more degrees as it is cold out. Kurusu tries to get out, but Mia pulls him inside her honkers and fully wraps her tail around him. This must be what heaven looks like. Kurusu grabs the end of her tail and starts to caress it, making her climax. She finally gets up, telling him he was quite feisty. Later, Kurusu prepares the bath, and just then Mia suddenly enters top naked, making his nose bleed. She casually makes her way into the tub when she notices his eyes on her. Kurusu tries to run out only to be pulled into the tub by Mia's tail. She starts undressing him when suddenly a cold shower pours into her, shocking her and freeing Kurusu. As he prepares breakfast, the TV announces the first idol group with demi-humans having consecutive hits and of the inner species bill, which allows communication between humans and non-humans. As he hears the announcers talk about the world not changing as much after the bill and disagrees, he jumps out of fear hearing Smith's voice his interspecies exchange coordinator. Smith says she is here to check that no harm is done to Mia. He questions her as she is the one whose mistake brought Mia into his house, rather than to the actual host family which Smith flat out denies. Smith informs him that he needs to study the law as Mia likes it here and is there to stay. Kurusu tries to defend himself as he would not hurt her only to experience a jump scare by Smith who whispers into his ears that harming her includes popping her cherry too. Kurusu has a sausage making it a possible situation so Smith asks him if she is not offered, as she can be really frisky. Smith informs him that demi-humans are representatives of their entire species, so if they were to be defiled by humans, they would be arrested immediately, and she would be sent back to their homeland. Smith continues her question, as she thinks Kurusu is an easy one to seduce and starts touching him. Then Mia comes in and yanks Kurusu with her tail towards her yelling at Smith that no one touches her darling hearing. So Smith reminds Kurusu of the rules again, and leaves. After she leaves, Mia asks Kurusu if the law is really that important, and tells him how when she first came to Japan, everyone else was put off seeing her snake body. She feared he would not like her as well, but he accepted her with a smile. She also tells him the law does not mean a thing to her so he can do anything he wants to her. She tells him she would let him deflower here if he wanted to, but Kurusu declines it. On top of that, her tail that's wrapped around him tighter is breaking his bones, but thankfully Smith arrives and saves him. Sometime later, we see Mia and Kurusu strolling through the town on a date. They go to restaurants, arcades, photo booths, which Mia really seems to enjoy. Still, she found not every place was designed for every species, and they could not do everything. Just then, she sees a board welcoming every species and enters. Kurusu sees it as a lingerie shop, so offers to wait out, but Mia drags him in and makes him choose. She shows him her honkers, saying she does not wear them often, so has no idea about them. As she drags him in the changing room as well, when he comes out in a panic, he accidentally grabs her panties which Mia gets shy about. His curiosity about how she wears her panties is finally answered. After this, they walk out, but some other humans hear Mia calling Kurusu darling and start laughing, making her angry. Mia strikes at them, but Kurusu gets in the way, reminding her that she will be deported if she hurts humans. To escape the crowd forming, they run into a love hotel where Mia gets fresh and finds some rubber and asks him what they are. Suddenly, she takes her robe off and asks him if he is also afraid of her and only treating her well because of the law. Just then, the door breaks down as the police barge in to protect Mia. As they walk out, they meet the same humans making fun of Mia in the street. They again start laughing at her and pass comments making her angry. But this time before she strikes them, Kurusu shows his superhuman strength and knocks them out. At home, Smith bandages Kurusu, and he also gets a chance to give a heroic dialogue about protecting Mia, cause she is a girl first. Mia gets so happy hearing this, she asks him to start from where they left off which results in Smith's entry again asking for dinner. Kurusu serves her curry while Mia pouts. The next day while doing laundry, Mia seems really happy that Kurusu was so cool yesterday. Suddenly a bird human flies there and takes Kurusu with her, literally two seconds after Mia promised to protect him. After a while, Kurusu wakes up on a tree in a park. The bird lady introduces herself as Poppy the Harpy, but she herself seems a little confused about it. Kurusu asks Poppy about her host family to find out why Poppy kidnapped him. Just then, she spots an ice cream stall and starts moving towards it. But suddenly she forgets who Kurusu is, as she has a bird brain. After buying the ice cream, she starts explaining that she ran away from her coordinator. While explaining this, she realizes she is in trouble, as she could be deported and drops her ice cream. She starts whining about it so Kurusu offers his popsicle, which she enjoys thoroughly. People around them start giving Kurusu dirty eyes, making him snatch the popsicle out of her mouth, making her sticky all around. Kurusu tells her to clean herself, but she strips right there to take a bath in the fountain. 
Just as she pulls Kurusu into play, Mia finds them, and she starts to shout at Poppy as she thinks Poppy kidnapped him and wants to elope with him. They start fighting each other while Poppy rips Mia's clothes, and Mia wants to make chicken soup out of Poppy. But while all this is happening, Kurusu notices no one is looking at them as a girl is stuck on a tree. Taking this chance, Kurusu makes both the girls dress. Poppy tries to fly to rescue the girls but falls face down as her wings are wet. Mia climbs the tree and tries to save her, but ends up scaring the girl. The girl starts to fall but Poppy flies and catches her, but her heavy wings drag her making her land on Kurusu. Everyone praises Poppy, making Mia upset, but Kurusu acknowledges her. Just then, a policeman comes around and thanks them. He asks him about their host family. Mia has Kurusu, and realizing Poppy could be deported, she sticks to Kurusu. He suddenly claims that both of them live with him, but the officer does not believe them, and asks for papers making them sweat. Suddenly Smith arrives and hands him the papers. That night Smith explains that she could not find a host for a runaway like Poppy, so she was planning to force No to ask Kurusu to take care of All agree to this, even Mia surprisingly does too, thinking Poppy is a child, but as soon as Smith tells her Poppy is the same age as her. Mia barges into the bathroom where Kurusu was bathing Poppy, and starts lecturing Poppy to stay away from Kurusu. The next morning Kurusu goes shopping as the fridge is empty. He is walking thinking about his budget, and suddenly gets knocked down by Centorea Shianus, who has special freedom to find their masters. She has learned from mangas about the intersection soulmate, but Kurusu denies it. Kurusu calls Smith, but as it's her day off, she asks him to take care of it. Suddenly they witness a purse thief. Being from the centaur clan, Centorea cannot ignore it, and asks Kurusu to join her, as she cannot lay her hands on the thief due to the law. Kurusu tries to ride her only to get hit in the face. She makes him hold onto her waist and runs as fast as she can. While chasing circumstances make Kurusu hold onto her honkers for his dear life for plot reasons, of course. At a point, Centorea's honkers come out of her shirt, also making the thief crash and Kurusu ends up riding her. She gets up to stain her sword with Kurusu's blood, but the thief gets to her sword first and attacks her. Kurusu being the hero jumps in front again and gets sliced. Later it turns out the sword was a fake, and Kurusu is okay. While explaining all this, Smith also explains that riding a centaur is like marriage to them. As soon as he realizes what has happened, he falls on his knees to apologize. But Centorea seems to have calmed down, and asks him to call her Saria, and apologizes for dragging him into the fight. Saying so, she pledges her lifelong loyalty to him, but gets interrupted by the other two girls. At last, they all sit for lunch, debating who keeps Kurusu first. One night all the girls grab Kurusu and fight each other talking about marriage. The previous day we see Mia revising the bill with the girls where she ranks herself first, as she had lived with Kurusu the longest, and the girls fight about that again. Just then, Kurusu asks Saraya to fill out her application, but Mia notices Saraya's footmark on him making her angry. Kurusu explains that he entered the bathroom while she was already there, resulting in this. This again instigates another fight between them. Suddenly Poppy's head overheats due to the bill so she wants to take a bath. Kurusu asks the girls but they are busy fighting so he goes to take a bath with her. Poppy starts undressing but Kurusu makes her wear a swimsuit while wearing which they make some sus sounds. Hearing this, Kurusu needs to cool himself so he jumps into the bath. Poppy also jumps on him. He thinks they behave like parent and child, but she tells him she thinks of him as a sibling, as he is kind to her even while scolding and he praises her. But suddenly she puts his hands on her honkers saying she felt her heart jump last he did so, and she wants to feel the same again. As he explains siblings don't do that, she tries to use force, but Saria shoots arrows at her as she found out Poppy's age, and now she won't let her do stupid things. Mia also enters shouting at Saria about her application, but Saria brushes past her with Kurusu on her back. She takes him to the park. There he asks her to cool down a little as she is in Japan, and to take advantage of the bill to gain a little freedom from her culture. He asks her if there is anything she wants to do, so she asks him to hold her hand which makes her all shy. Just then, the other girls arrive, and again start their fighting over him. As they start to use force, Smith fires a tranquilizer, but as always Kurusu comes forward and gets hit. Later when he wakes up, he sees the girls looking worried. They tell him they will hold back and not cause him trouble from now on to which he objects, and tell them they do go far, but as they are living together, they are family. This makes Smith smile as she explains that there is an amendment in the process saying humans can marry non-humans. So she asks him to marry one of them. Dropping this bomb, she leaves. Kurusu is in deep thought now as first she told him not to lay hands on them, and now suddenly this marriage proposal. That night Maya approaches him saying he does not have to marry if he does not want to. But finding out his dilemma is not about the magic itself, she becomes pleased. Maya moves forward to him and tells him how snakes mate all night long wrapped around each other and starts licking him. 
Before Kurusu can react, Poppy enters the room crashing through the window. Poppy too starts showing her horny self and tries to mate with Kurusu when Sereya bursts through saving him. She explains their behaviors as she points out its full moon which awakened their instincts tonight. Suddenly Sereya too goes out of control and offers her honkers to him, thinking if he proceeds tonight he might die. Kurusu tries to run away. Hiding, he calls Smith who tells him to decide who to marry or they will keep acting this way. Suddenly the girls catch him, but the way he falls on a ketchup bottle looks like a crime scene cooling the girls down. The next morning all injured, he announces that he is going to make his decision. Until then, he is going to date all three of them and collapses. The next night everyone is thrilled with the proposal and has their thoughts when Kurusu calls them for dinner. Mia goes into the kitchen and opens the pot, but instead gets attacked by a slime monster. Mia falls. While Kurusu is taking care of her, the slime again attacks him. When Saria tries to defend him, her sword has no effect. Suddenly the slime bursts, making everyone slimy. Kurusu runs to take a shower. Saria joins him, saying she wants to protect him and was also hoping he could clean her. He rubs her body and some of her sensitive parts. They both get in the bath, and Kurusu asks her why is the slime attacking. Saria explains it's probably looking for water, making him realize the bath is the most dangerous place. Suddenly water starts dripping from the ceiling and they realize the slime is there. Saria reaches for her sword but her hands land on Kurusu's sausage. Realizing that she slips out and the slime gets hold of Kurusu, the slime turns into a girl and suddenly starts washing him and copying the behavior of the girls. The slime engulfs Kurusu making it difficult for him to breathe so he jumps into the tub diluting the slime. Kurusu comes out and discusses the human form of the slime with the girls which they find amusing. They think of informing Smith but taking her carelessness in mind they don't. The next morning Poppy is on good terms with SUU the slime, but Maya and Saria seem annoyed as SUU engulfed all their stuff. The girls get uncomfortable that SUU is always naked, so Kurusu gives her a raincoat, which does not absorb water making it stay on her body. After that, they discuss she might not have come there with proper channels and could be an illegal immigrant, so they should inform Smith as soon as possible. Hearing their conversation, Poppy takes SUU with her and flies away. Suddenly Suyu starts panicking and they fall right onto Kurusu. Suddenly a group of kids approaches them asking Poppy to play with them. Kurusu realizes she has been sneaking around and playing with the kids. He also realizes she is indeed a good caretaker. Just then, seeing the kids happily diving into Poppy's honkers, Suyu absorbs some water and starts copying them. Then she sprays them with water and the boys run away into the road to play. Just then, a huge truck approaches the kids playing on the road. The truck goes out of control and is about to hit a girl, but SUU saves the girl absorbing the shock with her body. That makes her stick to a wall which cracks, and SUU starts to fall into the river. Thinking she will dilute Poppy tries to catch her, but SUU falls down saying thank you to her. Kurusu acts in time and saves her by driving the truck right beneath the bridge. He calls the girls back, announcing SUU is not a bad girl, just lacks common knowledge, and that he has decided to keep her. He tells them to think of SUU as a child, and they start imagining stuff. Kurusu warns them to hide from Smith, but just as he opens the door to the house, he sees Smith standing right there. Sometime later, the girls form an alliance to protect SUU. Suddenly, the doorbell rings, and the Interspecies Exchange Security Service enters the house and starts breaking the house down to renovate the house. The girls go to the park to hide. As they are hiding, Poppy spills water on herself while sharing it with SUU. So, SUU suddenly starts kissing her and licks her entire body, making her reach euphoria. On the other hand, Kurusu is running around town searching for them. He sees a girl in a wheelchair rolling downhill out of control. As she is about to crash, Kurusu comes between the pole and her landing right in between her bosoms and saving her. She introduces herself as Mero and thanks him. He tells Mero he needs to run as he is searching for the girls. She tells her she met them just a while ago. On the other hand, the girls are hiding when Saria hits a faucet and breaks it making her wet. SUU immediately starts sucking her behind which hit the faucet and her honkers making her the next one to reach euphoria. This leaves Mia untouched. The girls start having a stare down when Kurusu approaches them. Taking the chance when Maya gets distracted from answering Kurusu, SUU starts licking her as well. Having finished with all the girls, SUU jumps to Mero and Kurusu traps SUU in a plastic bag. After this long day, they reach home where the construction is over. They all think the construction is for SUU and are happy, but Smith informs them she cannot deal with illegal immigrants, so she does not see SUU. Hearing this, Kurusu asks her if SUU does not exist on record. Why did she make a room for her to which she informs him that the room is actually for Mero the mermaid, who will be joining them from today? Maya is really jealous of Mero, as she sees her as a love rival. In the attempt to prevent Mero and Kurusu from getting close, she ends up breaking Mero's wheelchair 
making Kurusu have to carry her everywhere. Mia tries hard to get his attention, but fails at every attempt. She tries making her uncomfortable with the temperature, but it backfires. She then tries to drag the other girls into it. Saria gets suspicious of Mero's behavior, and notes that even Smith was polite to her, so she questions her only to get touched by Mero's words about her kind. Mia, however, does not fall for her words, and tries to warn everyone, but Mero has everyone bewitched. Mia admits that she is the one who likes fairy tales, and wants her prince to carry her, but instead, Kurusu is carrying Mero. Hearing this, Saria suggests Mia also wear a swimsuit, as she thinks Mero is seducing him that way. They enter the pool, but Mero dives into the pool with Kurusu. Mia thinks Mero is showing her true colors, and dives into the pool, but ends up drowning. Kurusu saves her, and Mero hugs her tight to warm her temperature. Kurusu tells her to go take a warm bath, and Mero joins her where Mia learns that Mero desires a tragic love story, and is not thinking of marrying Kurusu instead, is supporting Mia and Kurusu. One day Kurusu finds a patch of scale near the door, thinking it's paper, he picks it up only making Mia jump on him in an attempt to hide it. She cries that she can't shed properly at the time when Kurusu has marriage in mind. Hearing this, Kurusu explains she might be shedding due to stress as snakes do, so revealing he has been studying. He offers to help her shed and starts peeling her which makes her moan uncontrollably, especially when he reaches her ends. He then starts peeling the front which ends in him penetrating. One evening as Kurusu comes back from work and shopping, Poppy suddenly announces she is going to lay an egg. The girls beat the hell out of Kurusu, but later find out it's an unfertilized egg. As they are discussing this topic, the doorbell rings, and it's a creepy director who heard that a harpy is going to lay an egg so he is there to record. Thinking it's an interview, the girls agree to be recorded. The creepy director records everyone's room and asks if they wear panties. While in Mia's room, he finds her shed skin and persuades her to give them to him for research purposes. While Mia is fooled, Kurusu hears the creep saying he would have gotten more if he could have recorded the shedding. Just then they all head to Poppy as she is laying her egg. The creep starts filming it, and even makes Kurusu sit and hold Poppy while she's laying. The creep gets so excited about the amount of money he could get for the footage, that he does not even realize SUU is copying his dialogue. Sue's words open everyone's eyes. They get ready to beat him, but he reminds them of the law so Kurusu comes into play. He tricks the creep with a normal egg, and punches him out. After all this, Poppy successfully lays her egg. That night they all are discussing what to do with Poppy's eggs, when Smith approaches Kurusu, and informs him that the creep's credentials were all fake, and she needs to investigate him. Just then, Kurusu asks where Poppy's eggs are which she kept in the fridge, and Mia accidentally cooked them. At the creep's place he is all angry at Kurusu for destroying his way of making money when he gets all wrapped in a spider web revealing half-human half-spider creature called Rachanera, interested in Kurusu. Somewhere in the city, a manga shop is attacked by orcs. They are keeping the otakus hostage to fulfill their demand of making the adult manga to be about orc with female knights. Talk about fetishes. The police are bound as the bill protects the orcs even in this scenario. Smith assured them, that is why she is there. Suddenly inside the store, the orcs catch a female agent trying to sneak in and shoot her. Hearing this, the police ask Smith to do something to which she assures them the arrangements are done. They suddenly find a schoolgirl hiding in the corner who panics seeing the body of the agent, and leaps and throws the blinds shielding the windows. Just then, a sniper called Manico shoots at them, staying one kilometer away from their smelling range as per the plan. Manico succeeds in unarming them, and suddenly the wall breaks entering an ogre named Tionicia, who frees the hostages. Suddenly the agent that they shot wakes up and shoots them all. One of the orcs notices that the bullets actually went through the agent questioning how she is alive. She reveals herself to be a zombie named Grovel, as Grovel is taking care of the last two orcs, the hostage that looks like a manga character kicks the orc and shows her true self as a doppelganger named Doppel. Just then, Smith enters, introducing the squad of interspecies girls called Monsters New Law, especially made to handle crimes done by untouchable non-human species. The orc tries to be smart, and surrenders thinking his only punishment will be deportation, but Smith shoots at him with rubber bullets. When the orc starts chanting the bill, but real Smith appears saying non-human to non-human violence does not violate the law, but has some restaurants overstepping the orcs. One day the squad reaches the creep's house making an attempt to arrest the Rachanera, but she succeeds in escaping. The squad however finds a paper with the address written, and on inspecting finds that the creep was not registered as a host family, yet was living with a non-human. While doing all this, the girls realize Kurusu has been kidnapped. Somewhere in a warehouse, Kurusu wakes up upside down and meets the Raknera, whose name is Rachni. Kurusu meets her and is quite composed, seeing that she thinks that he might have broken Poppy's egg. 
but he has to be a hypocrite like other humans, and she wants to prove that before getting caught. Just then, a guard comes in to check for the noise. Rachni hides herself and Karusu, and at the same time tries to seduce him. But despite all her efforts, Karusu survives, and asks her why she is running as she should be with her host family. She reveals that her host family did not like her, and sold her off to the creep. So now she believes that every human is the same, and only like species which look like them. She tries to emphasize this by saying only the human parts of her are getting reactions from his nether regions. Hearing this, perverted Karusu reveals his foot fetish. Smith reaches there with her squad asking Rachni to surrender as she assaulted the creep director. But Karusu misunderstands, and thinks the warning is for him. Karusu says he will turn himself in, and that way she can run away making her laugh. Later she surrenders, and Smith apologizes to her for not finding a good host family for her. Taking the chance, she indirectly hints she wants to live with Karusu, and Smith agrees. One morning, Karusu reaches his hands out to turn his alarm off, but instead grabs Saria's honkers who came to wake him up. While serving breakfast, Mia gets jealous of Rachni calling Karusu honey, and tries to attack her only to get tied up in her web. Mia looks for support from others, but gets none, as no one objects to her. That night, as tired Karusu goes to sleep, he falls into a web instead. When questioned, Rachni says she is creating a romantic rendezvous. Saying so, she undresses as the girls won't be a pest right now. But Saria slices the door down and leaves with Karusu through the window, making Rachni believe she might be more dangerous than her. One day, Smith invites Karusu into a maid cafe. The girls follow him as they suspect him of cheating on them with Smith. They send Marrow in disguise with the help of Suu inside the cafe. They want her to find out if they are on a date, but Marrow can't stop acting her part as she is imagining her tragic love story. Mia scolds her, and while this Marrow hears Smith talking about a date with Kurusu, while hearing their conversation, Marrow sweats, and Suu starts searching for water inside Marrow's skirt. Suu makes Marrow reach Euphoria, and while this is happening, Kurusu and Smith leave the cafe. Next, they head over to the arcade where Poppy blends in with a crowd of cosplay parties and spies on them. While Poppy tries to contact the other girls, the phone falls into her SUU make breakfast, and she starts massaging them in public to make SUU spit it out. While trying to get the phone, the scenario gets more bizarre and attracts more attention as the phone slides down her breast into her panties, and she rubs all over to get the phone. While the phone is in her panties, Saria calls her and it vibrates, making her reach euphoria. A group forms around her and shields her from Kurusu and Smith's eyes as they head out. Next, the two of them go to the park where Maya and Saria disguises as ice cream vendors by making SUU their uniforms and spy on them. Having divided SUU into two uniforms, Saria's bust have to fit into a tight shirt attracting a lot of customers to the truck. The crowd makes the two leave the site, and Mia catches them leaving. She hurries behind them pulling SUU with her and leaving Saria without a shirt in front of the crowd. Mia goes all stealth mode, but Rachni follows her to a love hotel and finds them through her webs. She wants to capture material to blackmail them. Mia can't believe that he is cheating on her, so she grabs Rachni and asks her to climb. Hearing their noise, the M1 girls pull them into the room, shocking the girls. Later, they all gather around, and Smith apologizes for not telling them that a threatening letter came for Karusu saying someone will kill him if he marries any of the girls. So they tried to lure the killer out by pretending to date, but it did not work with her. So later, Tionicia, the ogre from the Mon team, goes on a date with Karusu to lure the sender of the letter. She gets really excited about everything, and drags Kurusu all around town. With Tio, they first go shopping where clothes get stuck on her butt as she takes them off. So she asks Kurusu for help, who accidentally pulls her underwear down with the skirt. She gets so excited that she jumps out of the changing room in her undies, and buries Kurusu in her honkers. After all this, when no one suspicious comes around, they change the date to movies with Zombina. Although while walking, she drops her hands, scaring everyone around, and Kurusu stitches it in a cafe man of many talents. This spikes a convo about him not getting repulsed, and in Kurusu saying the right thing without knowing and making her heart beat. Although seeing him not tensed, she drops her honker and shocks him. She makes him stitch it, and as he does, he sees that she feels no pain, but when he goes to stitch the bottom, her moans come up. She plays it off, but when Kurusu asks about the blood on him, as he thinks it's hers, but in reality, it's his nose. Now it's Monoe Monaco's turn, and they go to a park. But while walking, they walk so damn far that it's weird, so Kurusu asks her to come closer. But it seems she is walking slowly, as her hat is covering her one eye so she can't see and bumps into everything. She falls down, and when Kurusu comes to help her, she asks if they can go to a private place as she doesn't like crowds. They head to an uncrowded place, and Monaco thinks of how she knows people don't like her by looking at their eyes as they always look away. 
to find out if Kurusu is really nice to them or is pretending she asks him to look her way, which Kurusu does and asks if something is wrong seeing flustered Monaco. Suddenly Monaco spots someone following them. She shouts and the M1 girls come out and attack the figure. Zombina shoots and Tio throws a whole vending machine to stop the figure from running. They all run happily thinking they can be free from the job, but when they unmask the figure, it's one of the Mon girls trailing them. On the other hand, Kurusu while returning runs into a Reaper-like figure. He goes home and the girls ask about his day only to find out a headless girl is the one sending it, and he brought her home. Mia tries to keep him away, but ends up in a position where the girl falls on her, and she gets sick. After all this, Kurusu explains that she seems to have lost her head so he couldn't leave her and brought her home. He plans to go out looking for her head at midnight as it's a girl's face, and he can't leave it out. The girls decide to help, and Rachni stays to look after the headless girl in SUU. They go out to find it, but Maya is really scared looking at it, so they all realize it's a severed head they are looking for, and if they get caught, they might be blamed for it. At last, Maya is the one who finds it and faints. Saria takes Maya and tells Kurusu to bring the head. He approaches it, but as it does not answer, she tries to pick it up only to get scared by it saying to not touch it so casually as she is the guide of souls and reaper of death. She says in a very fancy way that the organization is looking for her, and she needs her body for her powers. She first tries to command him to serve her, but when he does not understand, she politely asks him to take her to her body. They all return home and assemble the Reaper. Mero brings in some tea and snacks that the Reaper unscrews her head, and tries while Saria explains that she is Dullahan Headless Horseman, who appears to those who are on the brink of death. As the girls talk about her existence being like a fairy tale and imaginary, Kurusu asks if she is here for someone there going to die. The Dullahan says yes, and says Kurusu is the one on the brink of death. Dullahan says she is going to harvest his soul as her Eye of Baylor has seen his fate, but she ends up tied up by Rachni. The girls in order to save him ask Poppy to take him someplace safe, but Poppy while flying drags him through the road and smashes him through a light. Just as he is about to splatter on the ground, SUU jumps in and saves him. Seeing the event, the girls panic thinking he really is on the verge of death. Saria, thinking this might happen, has prepared a saddle so they can run away. While they run away she saves him from an accident and starts dreaming of a life away, as she thinks of this as honor through dishonor, the greatest desire of a knight. While she is dreaming about their life ahead, she does not even realize Kurusu has slipped and is being dragged by her. As she realizes she stops throwing him forward, loathing herself for not realizing she thinks of him being on the verge of death. Just then Dullahan appears. She throws Kurusu into the water to handle Dullahan on her own. I don't know about Dullahan but the girls might actually kill him. In the river, Mero has her fantasies and asks him to fertilize her eggs before he dies as a remembrance. She drags him underwater to do the devil's tango, but Mia comes in time and saves him. She thinks it's bad they keep putting him in danger. Suddenly she gets pulled up by Rachni's web. Rachni is with Dullhan and says he can't avoid his death, so they should stop making him suffer and put him out of his misery. Hearing this she asks them to kill her first. While her speech is going on, he wakes up and says they are so gullible and says if he gets home he will get married. Saying he is going home, he walks right into a truck's way, but turns out it's just a toy truck, and he explains that he is not fated to die. They reach home and Smith explains she is not really a death god. She is Lala who ran away from Smith again. How many is this seven? Eight? Is she really fit for her job? She asks her why she wrote the letters and Lala starts her long speech, but Smith cuts her and asks her why she came there. Lala explains she came there because she was shocked he did not die, even when he was on the verge of death, so she must harvest his soul. Smith becomes really scared hearing this and says every host family she goes to goes missing. Lala explains they were not on the verge of death to which Smith says they won't send her to a dead host. She offers to stay there and observe Kurusu to which suddenly everyone agrees, for some reason. Smith is impressed that he did not believe her based on her appearance like others, later realizing he understood because he had his emo phase. After all this, Kurusu's budget has become a huge mess and he can barely survive. Also. The fridge is empty as Mia cooked her poison. He goes to the supermarket, but that is also closed, so they all head to the market. There Mero does her magic and gets great quality fish. Saria does her magic and gets some free carrots and other stuff, as the non-humans become quite famous among the vendors. SUU understands his dilemma and takes him to Ki, a forest spirit. When Ki does not agree, SUU yanks her and starts sucking her breasts as that is something that Ki finds persuading. Ki agrees to them and leads them to a place where SUU checks the plants and tells Kurusu which of them are edible. After harvesting all day, they head home. 
That night, Karusu makes tons of food and is happy they have leftovers, but suddenly Smith and Emon girls come to eat, finishing up everything. Smith sees him desperate and asks what is wrong, but he tries to avoid it. But SUU tells her about his budget problem to which Smith says he can reimburse those costs. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.